my heart's beating a little faster than it was a few minutes ago, um, and it's about 10 degrees hotter up here. Um, I would tell you that I'm not nervous, but I don't want to start this thing off with a lie, so I won't do that. Um, we have an amazing pastor, and um, I'm so thankful for him. Um, if you're hoping that he was here this morning instead of me, I'm right there with you. Just don't tell me that, because then that'll make me feel bad. So uh, we're just going to jump in this thing. Um, Amy, I told Amy, I said, I, I wrote mine out like a script almost, because I know my brain goes everywhere. I will chase rabbits all kinds of places. My youth know I am scatterbrained. And she said, you just need to have Christy do this little symbol when uh, you're doing that. And I said, that will not work for me. I'll just say the word rabbit right in the middle of my sermon, so that won't, that won't help any. Um, we're going to be in Romans 8. That's going to be where our text is from in Romans 8. But, but before we can kind of understand the fullness of the good news that is in Romans 8, um, we're going to take a little quick trip back to Romans 7. Just a real quick trip through a few verses. Uh, the Apostle Paul... Uh, wrote this letter and so um, he is who's writing this and you see him in Romans 7 there's this tension going on and he he says right here in Romans 7 15 Romans 7 15 and we'll have it up here for you it says I do not understand what I do I don't know what's going on with me for what I want to do I do not do but what I hate I do it's kind of a tongue twister, but you guys feel that. You guys have been there. I, I've been there where I'm like, what is wrong with me? I mean, I'm, I want to do right, and I don't do it. What I do is the thing I shouldn't do. Um, I mean, you guys know, you know, I love Jesus with my mind. I love Jesus with my heart. But somewhere around Sunday evening, uh, evil is right there with me. <laughs> I don't know if you guys feel that, but this is kind of what he says in uh, Romans 7 21 it says so I find this law at work and he's talking about the law of sin and death in this I find this law at work although I want to do good evil is right there with me and I'll say amen brother amen Paul I'm right there with you man so he comes to this thing where he goes what is wrong with me and then uh, it leads him to say this in the next verses or the next verses that I have up here it says what a wretched man that I am. Like nothing good comes from me. In other words, you know what he's saying? You know what's wrong with me? Me. I'm what's wrong with me. And it kind of, you know, he's like, I need someone to do for me what I cannot do for myself. And it kind of leads him to take his eyes off of himself and ask this question on there. Who will rescue me? Not what will rescue me. Not what thing must I do to clean myself up. But who will rescue me? I mean, I need that someone to do something for me I can't do for myself. Who will deliver me? And then Paul answers his own question. And I love it. Because I, I love it when they do that. And I don't have to look it up. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and Paul says this. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I love that. Um, see, if we just start out in Romans 8, you kind of miss that tension that's going on with Paul in his heart. What is wrong with me? You know what's wrong with me? I'm wrong with me. So who's, who can help me? Jesus can. That's where he gets to. Uh, amen. That's right. In Romans 8, 8, 1 is where this is our main text for the day. And this is huge in living your daily life right here. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore... Now, therefore, is because of Romans 7. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that'll make even a Baptist shout, amen? Amen. That is huge news. Uh, there is no condemnation. And I looked up the word condemnation, and it was originally a legal term. And it means, in this context of no condemnation, it would mean no charge or no debt. That if you're in Christ, in the scheme of life, um, 
in that judgment that there is no debt that you owe in Christ Jesus. There is no charge against you. How huge is that news, amen? Um, but it, it, it's a legal term, but we don't usually use condemnation as a legal term. We usually see it as a building term. Um, you guys see a building, um, and, and they have slept a sign on it that says condemned on there. That building is under condemnation, which means somebody has inspected this building, and they go, uh, this is condemned. This is unfit. For use it is no good to be used so it is condemned and but I love that in this Romans 8 1 says therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus but I think a lot of us feel something a lot different than that we feel a whole lot of condemnation I mean a whole lot in our life condemned and I'll tell you that's that's the native tongue of our enemy right there because he will tell you that he will whisper to you you know what's wrong with you? You. You're wrong with you. You're unfit for use. Um, I mean, God looks at you and he goes, I can't use you because of what you've done. And the thing about it is, your feelings will support that because you'll feel that. They'll validate that. But here's the thing about your feelings. Um, they change all the time. For all different kinds of reasons, amen? I mean, what makes you happy one week does not make you happy the next week. How you take, how you take news during this time, when in a different circumstance, the news, the news is different, the way you take it in. Um, I love this, uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers, uh, the late Dr. Adrian Rogers, who was the pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church for many years, says this about your feelings. God doesn't do his deepest work in the shallowest waters. And that, I, think, I love that statement. That is huge. Your feelings change all the time. But if you're in Christ Jesus, 8-1 is a fact. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I know some of you are sitting there and say, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. I mean, I've done some, I've done some bad stuff in my life. Or, or it may not even be in your past. You may be going, brother, I'm going through stuff right now that I can't stop doing. I mean, I'm, I'm in the middle of sin like right now. And I love that in 8.1 it says, there is now, therefore there is now no condemnation. Um, not once you get yourself cleaned up, but there is now no condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus. The question is, are you in Christ Jesus? Because the bad news is, if you're not saved, if you're not in Christ Jesus, there is only condemnation. Um, but for those that are in Christ Jesus, um, I really don't care what your feelings say about that. Because your feelings are not your Lord. Jesus Christ is your Lord. And he says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, and I tell you, you need to, pre you need to preach uh, the truth of the Scripture to yourself daily because your feelings will go all kinds of places. Um, and I hear people all the time say, follow your heart. And I tell my youth all the time, that's the dumbest advice that you can take. That sounds so good, doesn't it? Isn't that such a greeting card right there? Just follow your heart. And yet, the Bible gives a laundry list of things that are wrong with your heart and none of them are good um, so don't follow your heart that will jack your life up don't do that um, follow Jesus amen uh, the more you preached that truth to yourself maybe over time your feelings will line up with the truth of Scripture um, but we're sitting there going how, how can there be no condemnation though because it seems like there should be some well um, I mean you don't know what I've done you don't know what I think you don't know what I struggle with. So in these next few verses, Paul's going to talk about it. He's going to explain the how. And in Romans 8, 2, he says this, Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. And he's saying there's this law of sin and death that is a try harder. Um, do more. I've told you before, 
that the gospel is not God is good, you are bad, try harder, see you next week. That's not the gospel. Try harder will get you tired. Try harder will get you frustrated. And that is the law of sin and death. But it says also there's a law of the Spirit that leads to freedom. How huge is that? Um, if you've surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus, you should be experiencing some type of freedom in your life. If, if you aren't, then you're not doing it right. Your, your mindset is wrong in how you're approaching your life. And guys, I did this for years. Um, I mean, I always heard there's freedom in Christ and his burden is light. But what I felt was um, I felt bound up and I felt like the burden was crushing is the way I felt. And that's because I was trying to live out the word of God in my own power and in th instead of through the power of the Holy Spirit. Trying to just keep the rules, keep the laws. And it's just exhausting is what it is. Um, if you're doing that, uh, if you're not experiencing that freedom, you aren't doing it right, you're putting the burden of your own performance, you're putting the burden on your own performance instead of trusting Jesus' performance on the cross. That's what's happening. Um, and you go, boy, you're talking a lot about freedom, but I've heard people say it's a war. And it is a war. We're told as Christians that to battle against evil. We're told to battle against sin and battle against flesh. Matter of fact, um, there's an English theologian from a long time ago uh, named John Owen. He says, be killing sin or it'll be killing you. So uh, there's a whole lot of truth in that. Uh, but you can't kill sin on your own. That takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Um, here's what Christ does, though. He gives, us, he gives us the freedom to fight. And you hear me say all the time, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. And, um, and speaking of feelings being everywhere, I'll ask you this. Um, you guys ever watch a Razorback football game? Um, because if you do, there's a lot of frustration mixed in with a lot of anger and a lot of stress with brief moments of happiness here and there. Uh, but, you're, man, you're all over the place with that thing. Here's, here's what I've started doing in the last few years. Um, if I can't watch it live, I record it, all right? If I record it and I check my phone later and we lose... I'm deleting that thing. We're not watching that. We're not spending hours watching that. But if we win, I'm enjoying every moment of it. I mean, even the same bad things that when you were watching it live that were driving you crazy, I don't feel that frustration. I don't feel that stress because I know that we win. So I'm all right when bad things happen. I'm all right when they stumble and fall because I know the ending. I know what's going on. Um... I don't know if you've gotten there yet, but I've read the back of the book in the Bible. We win. Amen? Um, if you're in Christ Jesus, the victory's yours. The game's over. The score's set already. Um, and here's the deal. Jesus is coming again. Amen? He's coming again. Satan's going to get thrown in the pit, and we're going with Jesus. That's what's going to happen. So in that, we have freedom. We have freedom knowing that we've won. I don't know... If you guys at Opar, I don't know if they still do that, but when we help coach some of the youth teams, you could only score seven runs in an inning, all right? No matter what happened, you could only score seven runs in an inning. They didn't want the score to get too out of hand. They didn't want to crush any little hearts or anything. And so uh, here's one of the deals. It's like coming into the last inning and you're up eight runs. It doesn't matter because uh, you're going to win anyway. So what it does, it takes the stress off of you and allows you to live out freedom in honoring Jesus Christ with what you do because you know that you win anyway. That's what happens. In the end, we win. It means that we're free from two things. We're free from the performance trap and we're free from pretending. Um, the performance trap is this. God is not in love with a future version of you. I mean, he's not just tolerating you now, 
But when you get cleaned up real good, then he'll love you later. Jesus loves you perfectly right now, right where you are. Um, it doesn't mean that he loves you on your bad days and he, he can't stand you on your, or loves you on your good days and he can't stand you on your bad days. You're free from that performance trap. And it also means you don't have to pretend anymore. Um, guys, we're told to bear each other's burdens. I, I, don't, I don't ever want you to feel like you just have to say everything's fine. Um, I have a, I listened to a lot of Joby Martin. Uh, Joby Martin is the lead pastor at an amazing church called the Church of 1122. They started six years ago with five people, and they run 10,000 now. Uh, almost 80% of what they run is through conversion. I mean, it's, been a, it's an amazing church, and, and he is a country dude who can just flat preach it. And he says this all the time, the fake you is doing just fine. The fake you needs no help. Just ask somebody, how you doing? Fine. Doing fine. But he also says this. He says a real Jesus died on a real cross for the real you. And if you really let him, he can really change your life. So guys, you don't have to go through and go, the holy thing to say would say that I'm doing fine, that I'm not struggling with stuff, because we know that's a lie. We're struggling with stuff, amen? We're struggling. But in Christ, we're free. Um, Romans 8.2, I'll, I'll read back through that. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And in verse 3 says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. You get that little part. In other, other words, religious rule keeping can't save you. We talked about doing things on your own, in your own power, will lead to one of three things. It will either lead to pride, You'll think you're better than everybody else because you're doing pretty good at that moment. Or it'll lead to exhaustion because when you do it in your own power, you're going to get tired. It's just going to get frustrating. There's a reason we're told not to be weary in doing good things is because on your own, you're going to get weary. Or it leads to hopelessness. Um, I'll say uh, being a Christian is not about sin management. It's about freedom in a relationship with Jesus. Uh, this is another example that Joby Martin gives as he calls beach ball theology. He said, have you ever taken a beach ball and tried to hold it under the water? Well, you can do it, but at some point it's coming back up, all right? And I don't know about, have you ever done that? Does it, does it gently come to the surface? No, that thing explodes out of the water. It usually hits you in the face or or something, well, that's what happens when we try to do it in our own power. We're told uh, to do all these things, and, and you got to stop doing this, and you got to stop doing that, and you got to do these things. So what we do is we grab the sin in our life and just hold it down in our own power. The thing about it, I can promise you this, you will get tired, or you'll slip, or you'll get bored, and at some point, that sin's coming back up. And that's works-based righteousness right there. That's the law of sin and death. That I got this. But the thing about it, the gospel and the cross is, you ain't got this. Um, in, that, in that analogy, beach ball theology, the gospel doesn't have Jesus coming along going, try harder. You can do it, you know. Pray harder. In the gospel, what Jesus would do is he'd come by, he'd just come by and pop the beach ball and say, that thing doesn't have power over your life anymore. I mean, you guys know in your own power, you spend so much time just trying to manage your own sin that you're not telling anybody about Jesus. You're not checking on your neighbor. You're not speaking truth into somebody's life. You're so bound up doing your own thing, failing, feeling that shame, trying again, failing, feeling that shame. And you're not living freedom. You're living bound up. You're living with that crushing burden. So you guys know what I'm talking about. But he says, in Christ Jesus, you have a freedom. Um, in Romans 8, 3, and 4, it says this. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. And here's what God did. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh 
that's on Jesus, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See, because God is holy and just and righteous and we are not, there's a righteous requirement of the law, is what it says. That sin must be paid for. And this is what it says, Romans 6.23, that's not up there. Uh, for the wages of sin is what? Death. So sin must be paid for because of God's justice. Uh, why weren't you just wiped out the first time you sinned? Because of God's mercy, the payment's delayed. And because of God's amazing grace, He pays the sin debt for you when you put your trust in Him. That is huge, guys. He, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He pays that debt for us. So he's telling us the righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the perfect life of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, in Romans 3.23, he explains it like this, starting in 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Or your version may say a propitiation. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that word. Uh, through the shedding of blood to be received by faith. I love the word propitiation. And I've talked about it before. That, that word just means a payment that satisfies. Is what that word means. That went on the cross when Jesus said it is finished. It means that the sin debt that we owed God was fully satisfied in Jesus Christ. He was the propitiation. He was the payment that satisfied, and it was satisfied by his blood, is what it tells us. See, um, for a couple thousand years before Jesus showed up, this is what would happen. You've heard Todd talk about this. Uh, uh, the Jewish people would come to the priest, um, and they would confess their sins, and the priest would transfer those sins onto a goat. They called the scapegoat. And they would release it outside the city into the wilderness to die. But people could basically see their sins leaving them. That was a representation of that. And then he would take a spotless lamb that was given. People would bring those sacrifices. He would take a spotless lamb and kill it. And inside the temple, which represented the presence of God, um, inside the temple, inside a room, inside a room, there was this little room called the Holy of Holies that only the priest could go into once a year. Um, and in this was the Ark of the Covenant. If you don't know what that is, have you ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? That's kind of what it looked like. It was this golden box with, you lift it with rods stuck through it because you couldn't touch it because you'd die. Um, and it had these like angel wings on top. Well, on the top of it is what they call the mercy seat. Now, inside uh, the Ark of the Covenant, along with a couple other things, were the Ten Commandments. And it's because we break those commandments that we deserve to be judged. But they would bring that, that lamb in, in their place, and they would sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat. And that was to cover over their sins for one year. But they had to do it year after year after year. And then Jesus shows up on the scene. And there's this crazy cat out there, uh, John the Baptist, uh, who's baptizing people in the Jordan River. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sins of the world. And he didn't say a Lamb of God that came to just cover over your sins for another year. He says, The Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. Not cover up. Take away the sins. That's huge, guys. So when Jesus' blood was shed on the cross, and he says it's finished, what's finished? The sacrificial system's finished because the propitiation, the payment that satisfies, has been made through Jesus. So if Jesus is the perfect payment that fully satisfies, that fully satisfies God, and you're in Christ, like we talked about, you know what that means? That God cannot be dissatisfied with you. Because when he sees you, he sees the perfection of Jesus. 
That's huge. Um, it says, God, God's not in love with a future version of you. And once you stop sinning so much, he loves you because of who Christ is. And if you're in Christ, he makes this exchange. Um, let me read this first. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, when you give your life to Jesus, there's this, I'll explain it to our students, there's this great exchange that takes place. Um, it is, uh, just think about it in terms of a classroom. It's a, it's a pass-fail thing. It's a heaven-hell thing. And passing is perfection. But guess what? None of us are there. We're all, I don't care if you live perfect from this day forward, you have a past. And you've messed up in that past. So we're all at a failing grade. And so what the Father says is that if you'll put your trust in Jesus, in what he's done on the cross, if you believe that counted for you, then what I'll do is I'll take your failures, I'll take your F, and I'll give you Jesus' perfect score. And there's this change, there's this exchange that takes place. And that is huge. That's the gospel right there. That's the gospel. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was condemned on the cross. He was condemned on the cross. And he is the payment that satisfies. In verse 5 and following, Paul's going to talk about the implications of that for living out our life. Um, it's true that we're fighting from victory, not for victory. He says this, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So it comes to an easy question. Do you want death or do you want life and peace? And that sounds like a dumb question, doesn't it? Uh, but people choose death all the time. Um, but we, don't ha we have the option to choose life and peace. And uh, he's saying this, we're all on a path that leads somewhere. And pretty much what you do and not your intentions is what counts. Um, it doesn't, I'll say this, if, if, if I'm here today and I want to go south to Texas, if I start going east, it doesn't matter what my intentions are. It doesn't matter the fact that I want to go to Texas. That path don't go to Texas. It don't matter how much you pray about your trip. It don't matter what worship songs you listen to in the car. You ain't going to Texas. All right? That's what he's saying. That everybody is on, is on a path. Um, ah, I can get my page. Everybody's on a path. One leads to life and peace. One leads to death. The path of life is the work of Jesus on the cross. The path of death is you and your own works. Um, and part of what he's saying here too, guys, for those that are in Christ Jesus... Why are you setting your mind on the things of the world? I mean, if you're in Christ Jesus, if you are saved, he's saying, why, why would you act like you're going to live in this world forever? Why are you putting all your hopes, all your dreams, all your time, all your resources into these few years you're going to be on this earth when this is not your home, if you're in Christ Jesus? Uh, we're called sojourners. We're just traveling through. This is not our home. Once you, once you are in Christ Jesus, once you're saved, heaven is your home. Not someday when you die. Heaven's your home right then. Uh, so everybody's on a path. And now this is, what, this is what Paul also says, that wherever you put your mind, the rest of you is going to go. Um, in, in 1 John 2, 16, it tells us all the world has to offer. And these are the only three schemes that Satan has, that the enemy has. It says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Uh, lust of the eyes is you see something and you want it. Um, it could be money. It could be stuff. Lust of the flesh, you may be thinking in terms of like sexual sin or pornography, something like that. And it could be... Um, it could be your traditional, you know, alcohol, drugs, those kind of things, but it could just be um, the couch. 
you just feel you deserve, you know, you think you deserve to feel a certain way. I know I have responsibilities. I'm just not going to do them. And then the pride of life. You want to be somebody. Um, this is something that we're, every single day we, we deal with. Um, to elevate yourself above where God has told you you are. Um, every day what we want to do is put ourselves on the throne and say, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do with who I want to do it, when I want to do it. And this is why we're told every day so we have to die to ourselves. because when you wake up, you want to serve you. Die to yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. So he's warning Christians, you know, why in the world do you want to set your eyes on the thing of the world, not set your eyes on the thing of God? And Paul would say this, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, that's a path. But it just doesn't lead you down the path that Jesus has set you free to live in, has set you free to travel in. And it goes a little further in verses 7 and 8. Romans 8, 7 and 8 says this, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Or in some other place in the Bible, you may see it say, uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And see, and you, you may say, I don't feel like I'm hostile towards God. I just don't think about him a whole lot. Um, well, here's the reality. The reality is there is one ruler and one reigner in the universe. And he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And his name is Jesus. So let's say you live in a kingdom that has this king. But you say, he's not my king. I'm not going to pay his taxes. I, I'm not going to do... I'm not going to do what he says. I'm not going to obey his laws. Well, that would be treason. And that would be being hostile to God. That would be hostile to the king. Here's the thing about it, guys, though. He's the only king I know that left his throne on a rescue mission to save the people who are rebelling against him. That's Jesus. That's what he's done. We're told we were enemies of God and that he came and gave his life anyway. Um... Romans 8, 8 and 9. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, those who are in Christ Jesus, you're not in the realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives, or some versions say dwells in you, and if someone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Um, I think he uses this not only because it's true because it's also lives or dwells can be a building term too like condemned he started that he started that thing off saying therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus i mean when the when the enemy whispers you're broken and you're abandoned and you're not fit for use what paul wants you to know is that god looks at you in your same circumstances with your broken up stuff, with your busted windows, with your leaky roof, with all the stuff the world condemns you for that says you're unfit for use, he looks at you in that same situation and says, no, not only are you fit for use, but I'm going to dwell inside of you. So just rip down the condemned sign and put up the sold sign because I'm moving in. And here's the thing, he doesn't come in and, and rearrange some furniture he comes in and builds a brand new house from the inside out. That is huge. Um, so the enemy wants you to know that you're condemned, that God can never use you, but the gospel tells us that you are not condemned, that you are fit for use, and his permanent address on this earth is in you. How amazing is that? That when anyone who believes that what Jesus did on the cross counted for them, the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit dwells inside every single believer. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you. That is huge, guys. Uh, Romans 8, 10, and 11 says this, But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. And it's saying as a Christian, um, you ask, is it possible for me to have victory over sin in my life? 
I think Paul would tell us, you know what, if the tomb is empty, yes, anything is possible. Uh, anything is possible, but not in your own power. Not in your own power. Um, the same power that brought Jesus out of the grave is in you. Wow. question is, is Christ in you? Um, C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, this is speaking on behalf of God, says this. Give me all of you. I don't want so much of your time, so much of your talents and money, so much of your work. I want you, all of you. I have not come to torment or frustrate the natural man or woman. That part just means he didn't come to just make you act better. I have not come to torment or frustrate the natural man or woman, but to kill it. No half measures will do. I don't want to only prune a branch here or a branch there. Rather, I want the whole tree out. Hand it over to me, the whole outfit, all your desires, all your wants and wishes and dreams. Turn them all over to me. Give yourself to me, and I will make of you a new self in my image. Give me yourself, and in exchange, I will give you myself. My will shall become your will, and my heart shall become your heart. And that's the message of the gospel right there, guys. The enemy says you're condemned because of what you've done, but the Father says that you are alive and you are victorious and you are free because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. Um, in Revelation 3.20, he says this. He gives these words to the church at Laodicea. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And that last little part, eat with that person, they with me, in the first century, eating together was a very intimate thing. So what he's saying is, if you, hear my, if you hear the knock and you hear my voice and you'll come open the door, then I'll come in and have a personal relationship with you. I'll have a close relationship with you. Here's the thing, though. I can't make you hear the knock. And I can't make you hear his voice. Um, I remember when I was 10 years old, uh, for whatever reason that day, the knock got real loud in my life. And over in that chapel right there, uh, I'd been white knuckling a pew for weeks, man. I knew I should respond. But that knock got so loud that day that I had to respond. I came and I gave my life to Jesus. And this forever changed me. I hadn't always held up my end, but he has always been faithful to hold up his end. And I know through the promises of God, heaven is my home. And that's not because of what I've done. It's because of what Jesus did for me. That now I'm in Christ Jesus. The question is, are you in Christ Jesus? I mean, you hear the knock, some of you may be hearing the knock now and you say, something's wrong. Who's going to deliver me? You say, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I believe that when Christ died on the cross, that counted for me. And I hear his voice and I hear his invitation to have a relationship with him. I hear the knock. I don't know how to explain it, I just can't deny it. I hear him knocking on the door of my heart. So, guys, I want to give you a, I want to give you a chance to come open that door for him in your life. Um, accept the invitation for Christ to come into you to wash away your sins, to forgive you and adopt you as His own, to make you a new you. I want you to say yes to Jesus. If you would, uh, if you'll bow your head, close your eyes. And if you would say, that's me, Brother Danny. That thing you've been describing, I've heard the knock of God on the door of my heart. And I've been rejecting God, either through rebellion or religion. 
But today, for the very first time, I believe that when Christ died on the cross, it counted for me. And I want to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to give you a chance in just a few minutes just to raise your hand. Jeff, you can go ahead and play the music. Um, I'm going to count to three on three. If you want to give your life to Jesus, I want you to just raise your hand up. One. You hear the knock? Two. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And three. Three. If you're ready to welcome him in, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand right where you are. You don't have to come up. It's right where you are. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just I thank you for your word, God, and I thank you for your Holy Spirit that you would love us so much that you would reach out to us, God, that you would, that you would come to our door and knock, God, that you would speak to us. God, I pray that even if they didn't have the courage to raise their hand for you right now, God, that, Lord, if they just want to come and talk to one of us or talk to me afterwards, uh, that's all right. That's okay. You can do that, Lord. Well, I just pray that those that are struggling, God, that you would work in their life. They would allow you to work and you would just ease their pain. Lord, I just give us the strength to, to give in to the Holy Spirit and just live a life this week as a thank you for what you've done for us on the cross, God. And we'll, we'll just be quick to give you all honor, all praise, and all glory. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We pray that God spoke to you through the message. If you'd like to keep up with what's going on at FBC Kaiser, you can find us online at fbckaiser.com or download our app. We hope to see you soon, and may God bless you.